Welcome to the Five Rivers Podcast. For more information, head to fiveriverschurch.com. We now join our services already in progress.
promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You've never failed. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness.
you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you're a good good father it's who you are who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us you are perfect in all of your ways 
You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Thank you, Lord. You're perfect in all of your ways. Such a good, good father. Father, once again, we thank you so much for the outpouring of your presence and your spirit this morning, Lord. We thank you for being a good, good father to us this morning. We're overcome by your presence, Lord. throughout this service, Lord, throughout this day, throughout this week, throughout this year, Lord, you continue to unleash your presence upon us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Could uh, get the ushers to please come forward. We'll uh, we'll pray and take the offering, and then I've got a short announcement. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for each one of us in here today. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do for each one of us today, and what you're going to do for this church, Lord. Lord, we ask that today you would bless the gift and the giver, Lord. Multiply it, Lord. Direct us and show us how to use it to glorify your kingdom. Lord, we give you praise for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you see in your bulletin this morning, if you didn't get one, shame on you. Um, We have Reverend Robert Tucker coming on June 3rd. will be our first candidate to take the pulpit. Um, So a few things about that day. He will come. Um, Him and his family, wonderful family, great guy. Uh, We've spoken several times. We actually met yesterday for a few hours. Um. But he's going to come and preach, and then uh, we'll go across. We'll have a uh, little food, fellowship. Not quite sure what's on the menu yet, but something light. Um, we'll you know, break bread together, hang out, fellowship. We'll have a question and answer session for him. Um, not quite sure. I mean, we'll obviously have to rein in a little bit, but we'll let it go and see how, how it plays out. Um, and then immediately following that, we're going to have a brief business meeting, and this will all happen on June 3rd after church. Um, some business that we need to take care of. And then we actually will not be voting on his candidacy until the 10th, which will be the following Sunday. Um, It does fall in accordance with our bylaws. We're allowed to do that. Uh, We figured we want to take the time, um, not only for us, but for him. We'll have that week. We can fast. We can pray. Um, And then that way we're making a spirit-led decision on, on, on June 10th. Um, it gives us time. So uh, it's completely in accordance with our bylaws, so we're allowed to do that. I know we always just went straight over and met and voted and all that, but we're going to take the time to take that week, uh, fast, Amen. pray over it all, and then um, we'll <laughs> be back on the 10th. Yeah, you're already on. We'll be back on the 10th for another short business meeting. We'll try to keep both of them as short as possible, but um, we want to make sure that everybody's okay with it. The third will be a long Sunday, so... Um, Block out your calendars. We'll be here once he leaves for some follow-up questions if you have anything else uh, for anybody on the board. Uh, But at this time, I'll hand it over to Jeff. Thank you, Jamie. Are we rejoicing in the Lord always today? Amen. How many are just praising the Lord for our great... uh, Praise and worship team this morning. Amen. Let's give them. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
I'm always glad to see a couple guitars and the instruments, and my heart just rejoices in, in that. Amen. <laughs> Amen. How many know what today is? Ah, you do know, Pentecost. All right. When you read the Old Testament, we're going to talk a little bit about what Pente Pentecost was to the Jew and what, what it was set up. But then out of Pentecost, in Acts uh, chapter 24, when they, uh, or Acts chapter 2, I'm sorry, at the end of that, it talks about the hope that David spoke about, and he was prophesying the, the coming of the Spirit of the Lord on the earth. So we're going to talk about how is your hope? How do you hope? And is it hope that's living and abiding in you today? So let's pray. Father, I thank you. I rejoice in your presence today. We thank you for the day of Pentecost and what happened on this day. We thank you, Lord, that it is founded in the feast days of Judaism, but in the reality that is you in Christianity, it has become something far more powerful, something far more important to us as believers. Because it's the Spirit of the Lord, hallelujah, that rose up and baptized all of those on that day. Amen. Baptized them in the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost. Fire and the Holy Ghost. A new spirit that was poured out on the earth. So we thank you for that day we call Pentecost. And we thank you now as each person in this room, Lord, as they hear today, and if they do not have that Holy Spirit of fire burning in them, we pray right now that that anointing, that fire will rise up and pour out of them in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Pentecost, I, you know, I, I realize this week, as my wife and I were in Texas visiting our little nephew, Eli, Elisha, he's named after. But boy, what a fireball. <laughs> he's really going to be an Elisha, I think. <laughs> but it's fun. I, have you noticed how many families are naming their kids new names? Eli, Elijah, Elisha. You know, a lot of biblical names are starting to rise up. So we praise God for this dedication today. And we, we just thank you that that young man will be a servant of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. But Pentecost comes from the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks, and it's called Shavuot in Hebrew. It's mentioned in five different places, and the Greeks called it Pentecost. The Hebrews called it Shavuot. It's mentioned in five books. It's in Exodus 23. It's in Exodus 24. Leviticus 16, Numbers 28, and Deuteronomy 16. It was a celebration at the beginning of the early weeks of harvest in Israel, and there were two harvests each year. The early harvest came during the months of May and June, like we're celebrating now, and the harvest in Israel, since it's warmer and hotter there, uh, they're already doing an early harvest with barley and, and uh, in a, like a month later, uh, the first crop of wheat is harvested. So they, they called that Shavuot or Pentecost. Um, these harvests or festivals, celebrations, took place, they, some of them took place before Pentecost. There was Passover, number one. There was the unleavened bread celebration. And there was the Feast of First Fruits or Pentecost. Here's, why, here's the way they figured out Pentecost, and I, had to, I never knew this. According to the Old Testament, you would go to the day of the celebration of first fruits and begin with that day, you would count off 50 days, which is why the Greeks call it 50 days, or, or call it Pentecost. The 50th day would be the day of Pentecost. So first fruits is the beginning of the barley harvest, and Pentecost is the celebration of the beginning of the wheat harvest. Since it was always 50 days after first fruits, 
the 50 days also equaled what they call Feast of Weeks or seven weeks. So a week of sevens. It also came as a week, a, week, a few weeks later. Therefore, they called it the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks. There are three things that we need to know about Pentecost. Three things. Pentecost was a pilgrim festival. That meant that according to the Jewish law and the adult Jewish men would come from wherever they were living in Jerusalem and personally be in attendance. So wherever you were in Jerusalem, you were, as a pilgrim, were expected to be there on the day of Pentecost. It was a holiday. There wasn't any work being done. Everything was closed. And it was a type of festival. There were certain celebrations and sacrifices and offerings which were prescribed in the law for the day of Pentecost. And then on Pentecost, the high priest would take two loaves of freshly baked wheat bread and offer them to the Lord. And that wheat bread would have been the first fruits of that spring wheat harvest. So that's what he would offer as unto the Lord. And then they would celebrate that. So first fruits was celebrated on Pentecost in the Greek wording, and it was to celebrate the actual first wheat harvest, and then they would offer up bread. Now, it's interesting that the Lord chose that day to be the, the baptism or the first fruits of who we are. That day, he was going to take the harvest, take the spirit and the planting of Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. He took that planting and then the Holy Spirit came 50 days approximately after the resurrection of Jesus. So the, the seed was planted by Jesus Christ. And then the spirit of that seed manifested 50 days later. And it was called the first fruits. Now that first fruits is important in our relationship to him, isn't it? In other words, he was a type, the Son of God and the Son of Man, but he was the type of what each of us were to be. And that that same spirit was going to be planted in you if you would accept it. If you would accept it and believe it. Now, how do you believe it? How do you believe something like that? And I don't have enough time, but we're going to talk a little bit about how you believe. You hope. And that's the question I want to ask. Is your hope and belief in that hope strong? Or are we, or are you wishing? Let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 1 through 27, and we'll just read that. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. I'm in the King James. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How come we hear every man in our own tongue? wherein we were born. Parthians. The Parthians was a country or a group of uh, society that was in Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and southern Russia, all the way to India. The Medes. They were in Iran and in, or what they call Persia. The Elamites, southwest Iran. The dwellers of Mesopotamia, that is in Iraq. And Judea, which was in Israel. Cappadocia, which was in modern-day Turkey. Pontus, which is in Turkey, Asia, Turkey, uh, Figria, Turkey again, Pamphylia, which is 
the southeast corner of Turkey, Egypt, and in the parts of Libya, northern Africa, Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretans, which is where Billy's ancestors come, Crete, <laughs> um, and Arabians, the, the Saudis were there. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, one to another what, what's this mean? What, what is going on here? Why are all these people speaking like this? Others mocking said, well, these, these are just full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the, the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, roughly nine in the morning. <laughs> it's funny, I, we had an interesting experience when, when Billy was filled with the Holy Spirit. We were at a church out in Salt Lake City, and it was a new baptism for her. And her mother called that night after we had come home. And her mother's going, are you drunk? Are you drunk? Because there was joy, real joy, coming. And when you know the Lord, that real joy will bubble out. <laughs> and others will look at you. What is the matter with you? What is the matter with you? So Peter's saying, hey, th these aren't drunk like you suppose, <laughs> seeing these but the third hour. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And in Joel 2.28 it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out, of, out my spirit upon all flesh your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days where I pour out my spirit. Notice, ladies, this is a good verse for you. I will also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In other words, that was significant for the Jews because women weren't to have any part. But God is saying here, ladies, I'm going to pour it out on everybody. Slaves, men, and the handmaids. It, this baptism is for all of you. Amen. It's for all of us. Then in, back to verse 217, uh, and it shall, I read that. That was the Joel scripture. And in the Greek scripture, it says something. It's, it's the same, but it's a little, slightly different. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit. That word of is significant, I think, in the Greek, in the New Testament. I will pour out. Joel says, I will pour out my spirit. But in the Greek, it says, I will pour out of my spirit. Now, where, if you're filled with the Holy, Sp uh, Holy Spirit today, where is that spirit dwelling? It's in you. It's in you. And Jesus' final prayer in John 17 was that the Spirit of the Lord would be in us. He said, I would that the Spirit of God would be in you as it's in, as, as it's in me, as I am in the Father and the Father is in me. In other words, he was showing the correlation of this relationship that you were to have. The Spirit was to be in you, and then you were to be in him, and these are one. And we'll get to that scripture as one uh, in a moment. But I will pour out of my spirit. So the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit in these last days is to come from all of us as individuals. It's to come from us for the blessing and the understanding and the purposes of God on the earth. That means you are in him and he's in you. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And if he's not today, you're going to have a chance. <laughs> you're going to have an opportunity to say, okay, I'll, I, I, I finally think I understand this. God has something for me. All right. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. How many are dreaming dreams? I'm just curious. How many uh, men are dreaming dreams or uh, having visions? Any of, you, any of the men here today? that you'll raise a hand. I see one. Anyone else? Those dreams and visions are for you as men. 
And I want to encourage the men today. You know, we don't want just the handmaids to participate. It's our obligation and responsibility as men to participate. And the Jews would always focus on the men, but at, the men are critical in God's eyes for this reality to take place. So men, I encourage you to know that the dreams and the visions that God will give you as a submitted man to the Lord will be powerful and will serve a purpose and will help move things along, not only in your family, but in your, uh, your work and all that you do. So I encourage you men to know that that spirit will be in your dreams. Men have dreams about the things they can build or want to do. And God will enhance those dreams. He'll show you the truth about what your dream should be about and how that will fit into his plan for building the kingdom. Because the kingdom of God will be built. And it's being built. It, and you're, you, we know, we look around the world, we see the shootings, we see all the things. And do we judge by what we see? Don't, that's not the kingdom of God. God is going to transform and change that. But there's going to be a period of time, and the Bible says there's seven years, by which all that transformation will take place. That whole transformation of mankind will take place, and it'll start with you as you allow that spirit be, to be poured out of you as an individual. That transformation will start to take place, and this world will change. The Bible declares that it will change. But we have to have something to make all that happen. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth, beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord. I'm in Acts 2, 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden to it. A few weeks ago, my wife and I were down in um, uh, Kern, Kernersville, uh, North Carolina, and our little nephew, uh, he was 11, he died of cancer. And I said, Lord, how do I talk to 250 kids about the death of their friend? You know, what... What, what, what can I possibly say? The pain that the school was feeling, the community was feeling, the family, of course, was feeling. And the Lord told me, he said, tell them that death is an enemy and that it will be destroyed. The Bible says that even death itself is the last enemy that will be destroyed. So the Lord said, encourage those kids to search out the truth about my spirit and how that death will, and destruction will take place. And see, you as well will defeat death when you rise and are raised. This flesh will pass away, but even that will change. So I was encouraging the kids to destroy the enemy that's death. And I encouraged them to, you know, to understand that God's word, that the spirit of God needs to be the foundation by which they search out that truth. If they're going to be a doctor, love the Lord with all your heart and search out the truth about that enemy of disease or whatever that's going on, whatever God has called you to do. If you're a lawyer, search out the truth about a judgment or a situation. Search it out and don't allow the lies of the perversion to prevail anymore. God wants the kingdom of God built and he's going to build it. And so I said that to those kids, and they, they, they were all excited. <laughs> Even though we're sad, we're celebrating Connor's life, but, but we're celebrating the fact that even death, maybe in our lifetime, will be defeated. Amen. All right. 
Therefore, and this brings us to the scripture that took place on the day of Pentecost. And this is David. Um, it's referring back to David's prophecy. Therefore did my heart rejoice. This is David talking. And my tongue was glad. Moreover also, my, f- my flesh shall rest in hope. My flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. David says that in Psalm 16, 8 through 11. Now, when we hope and are conscious of it, do we have an awareness of what that is? You know, I had to think this week, am I hoping or am I wishing? Or am I, is it a human desire I'm having? And so I I had to give this some thought. How do we respond? Do we really know what hope is, or is it just wishful thinking? Well, I just, or you'll use the word hope casually. You'll just say, oh, I hope so, you know. But where is that foundation of hope coming from? Some of the meanings in new uh, dictionaries say the feeling that is wanted can be hell or ca- that can be had or that events will turn out for the best. To give up hope or to have hope. A particular, number two, a particular instance of this feeling is the hope of winning something. You know the feeling you have when you want to win something, don't you? If you want to win a baseball game, you think of the, the feeling of that. The modern uh, translations or dictionaries describe it that way. There is little or no hope of his recovery, a person or thing in which expectations are centered. The medicine was her last hope. In other words, are you putting the hope in the thing or the object to do what's needed? That can be a problem because you often can be disappointed by that, and there often can be anxiety. So who are you putting your hope in? David said that in that prophecy concerning the day of Pentecost, he said, this is what my, this is everything we're going to stand on is hope. And I realized, you know, we talk about God's love. We sing about God's love. But what are the three the Bible talks about? Faith, hope, and love. But I I was trying to think, had I ever heard a message on hope? (laughs) I've heard lots of them on love. I've heard lots of them on faith. But I think we have a hard time understanding what hope is, so we tend to to say, well, I hope so. (laughs) You know, we use that, uh, we use it loosely, you know. Anyway, um, or I was working at a large international ministry. I saw people give up hope because the evangelists fell into sin. So they, I had to look at that. Okay, was that hope, was there hope in the evangelist? Or was there hope in Christ, see? So when members of ministry fail you, ask yourself, is my, and we need to, oh, this is when it concerns a new pastor. Don't put your faith in, I mean, you put your, encourage him and all those, but you don't, that's not where your faith ultimately lies, is it? We as a church have learned over the past few months that our trust and our faith is in the Lord, amen? And that's where our hope belongs. Our hope will belong in that. That way, if a pastor senses that hope is in the congregation, he will have good success because that hope will be in you. And it'll be a hope that's in Christ and not your hope in him that, oh, I hope he does a good job. I hope he's, you know, you know, you, you got to be careful about where your hope is. Hope in the Lord. Okay. There are other ways. Something that is hoped for, Uh, to look forward to with desire or reasonable confidence, to feel that something desired may happen. We hope for an early spring, maybe a spring with less rain. (laughs) Right. Sunshine is going to show up this week in Jesus' name. Now, it's interesting. That was the hope in the, those were some of the definitions in the New Dictionary. So I went back to my uh, Webster's 1828. How many have a Webster's 1828 dictionary? A few of you do. Boy, what a difference. That 1828 dictionary 
uh, bases a lot of the definitions on what the Bible says a particular word or aspect should mean. So this was the 1828 definition of hope. A desire of good accompanied with at least a slight expectation of obtaining it or a belief that is obtainable. And it gave a difference here. It says, hope differs from wish and desire in this. It implies some expectation of obtaining the good desired or the possibility of possessing it. Hope, therefore, always gives pleasure or results in joy. Real, real hope will fill you with joy. Whereas wish and desire may produce or be accompanied with pain and anxiety. So I was going to use the board to draw this, but it's a little too small. But picture it this way. When you wish something, it's a chance that that wish might not be true. There's a chance it might not be true. So where does that wish lead you? It, in your own mind, your will, and your emotions, it might lead to a selfish wish, which then, then you start thinking about it, and then you go, oh, that may not happen. So what, what's that produce? There's a fear that it won't happen. It starts to grow in you. So you're taking a wish, you're telling your mind, and then, you're, then because it's originated from your desire, fear can set in. And I'll show you the difference between that and what a desire that's of God. So that fear then will produce doubt. Then you go, well, maybe this isn't supposed to happen. Maybe this won't happen. So you've gone from fear to doubt. Then, then you'd start thinking, may, well, then you might develop an attitude of mistrust. In other words, you don't trust what the thought process you've just gone through. See, and men, you know, within your business or your work, it's important that you have confidence in what you do. And the people you work for or do the work for, they, they want to know that you're sure about what you're doing. Amen? Well, God's the same way. He wants you to be sure about his relationship with you. He doesn't want you to doubt it. What was the weapon that Satan used? Doubt. Hath God said. That's all it took. And he said, oh, well, but then see what happened? She took the doubt of that other, something other than God's word, and then, then that doubt will produce inaction, or mistrust will produce inaction, which will lead to poverty or nothing or anxiety. So that it's important to think through your processes. If you have hope in something, first go back to the foundation. Is that hope originating in the Lord? How do we know what the Lord's will is? Well, we have to read this word, don't we? You have to, <laughs> you have to read this. <laughs> and then study, and then believe it. Believe it. What does Hebrews 11 1 say? Faith is the evidence of what? Things hoped for, the substance of things unseen. Now think about that again. We always tie it to faith. But it says faith is the substance of what? Hope. So hope is the very foundation by which your faith will arise. It's the substance. So if you're wishing about something, chances are your faith might be a little off whack. <laughs> it might be a little weird. Are you hoping and operating in the desire and the purpose of God? Faith is the substance. Substance is the reality. It's real. So faith is substance of things hoped for, evidence of things unseen. So you're hoping, say, for a better job. You're hoping for healing. Is that real hope? 
And are you standing on the hope that the Bible declares you can stand on for someone's healing? Or are you maybe a little apprehensive because you might have a, a, sh a shade of doubt there because you've seen so many people not healed? I know that always wants to attack me. But God says, declare it. Believe it. Know it. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes that's hard. That's really hard. And it, but then that's when you have to say, it's not by might. It's not by power, but by his spirit. In other words, that's when your hope then truly then gets founded and based on the word of God, on him. Amen. So do you see the two lines there? The two lines, one where if you're, if you're going to take a truth of the Lord, it'll be God's desire, John 17, I would that I would be in you, you and me, and the Spirit will come out of you. That will lead to hope. That hope is the substance of your faith, which will lead, when that happens, then you start to develop what? Confidence. Confidence to keep going. When, my, when we first joined the church, you know, I kind of wondered about tithing. I said, oh, I don't know about this tithing stuff. But I found, a, I found a scripture that says, test God regarding the tithe. I said, so Billy and I said, well, let's test this. Let's see if it works. You know, I just, because I had a lot of mistrust of stuff, you know, stuff you say, ah, they want my money, you know, all this stuff. So I tested it. We tested it. And guess what? Our business prospered. We grew financially, emotionally, spiritually. Out of that tithe and that decision to give our first fruits. See, really, when you think about it, the first fruits in Pentecost is about giving because they gave that to the Lord. So that giving then led to the manifestation on Pentecost of the Spirit of God being poured out. So that giving that we do, know that that giving is beneficial and it'll bless you. If you haven't made that decision, I encourage you today to test it. If you're new in the Lord, test, test the ties, see if it works. Job 8, 13 through 15. So are the paths of all that forget God. And the hypocrite's hope shall perish. What's a hypocrite? Somebody that's pretending or make-believing, you know, or says one thing and what? Does another. So when you're in that line of developing hope, don't stop with just hope. See, hope is the foundation by which will come healing, deliverance, understanding, wisdom, so that hope has to keep growing. If it's God's hope, it'll grow. It'll grow. Because that's what the first fruits of Pentecost was about. They're celebrating the fact that that barley grew. <laughs> that that wheat took hold. And they took that first part of that wheat and then offered it back to the Lord. The sacrifice and the giving back to the Lord. Hallelujah. Genesis 8, 22 talks about seed time and harvest will continue on the earth for as long as the earth is here. So that seed time and harvest is based on the premise of hope. hope. Romans 8, 18 and 28. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Where is the glory going to be revealed? The manifestation of his presence is going to be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. See, that manifestation is taking place in each of us. If you know the Lord, now what is that manifestation? It's the hope grows that manifestation because we as human beings are in a seed configuration right now, right? The Holy Spirit has been planted in you. And for the past 2,018 years, that seed has been what? It's been maturing in mankind. Thank you. 
Now, what happened on the third day with Jesus? He rose, and he took on his new form, didn't he? Now, the Bible says a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. It says that in Psalms, and it says it in Peter. So by God's clock, what day are we entering into? The third day. This is 2018. We're early on the third day. So things are about to come. <laughs> things are about to start changing. Are you ready? <laughs> are you ready? The kingdom of God is being built. And that is to be your hope today. That is to be your hope. Hallelujah. The hope of Israel is the Messiah. They will eventually realize that Jesus is their Messiah. If you have a note there, Zechariah 12, 10, it says they're going to see whom they've pierced, and they'll, they'll, they'll realize that Jesus is the Messiah. See, the whole world is going to realize that. Billy was a Muslim. She was hoping and wanting something better as, an, as a Muslim. And the power of Jesus Christ changed her. Changed her. So the Lord can change Muslims. I mean, she, comes, she was born in Turkey. She was Muslim through and through. Her family still was, is still, many of them are. We've been working and talking with them. But God is going to change all the sons of Abraham. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the sons of Hagar moving a little slower. <laughs> So, but we got to love them. We got to sit down and have a glass of tea or coffee or something with them and allow the Holy Spirit to come out of you and minister to them. That's how we would minister in the Islamic world. We'd let the Holy Ghost set up the scenario. You can't, you really can't go hit them with, because the, the, a lot of times they'll know the scriptures better than you do. <laughs> Some of them do. <laughs> but allow the hope that's in Christ to take hold. Uh, Joel 3.16, but the Lord will be the hope of his people. The Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Why do you think we set up the embassy in Jerusalem as Americans? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> That's a start. That's a start. But we do that. Some of us in our nation realize the importance of that. Other presidents saw it politically, but I think the, the current administration said, okay, let's just follow through. But I think the power to do it came from God because it's, it's God's time that we as an Americans recognize that we need to be in alignment with Israel. Amen? <laughs> That's going to be important. <laughs> Hallelujah. First Peter 1 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a living or lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, a living hope. See, we have to hope about all this, don't we? We're, because it hasn't manifest yet. But you don't see the farmer, and I, I thought this was funny, uh, our, our pastor out in Salt Lake City, he says, you don't see the farmer out uh, when he's planted the corn or the wheat or whatever it is. Grow! Come on, grow! You know, we have a tendency in our own understanding of God's Word to just say, how come this hasn't happened? I mean, we've been reading about it for 2,000 years. Why hasn't it happened? Well, this is a, a seed that takes a couple thousand, maybe 3,000 years to take, to, to start coming up. So humans take time. <laughs> How many will agree with that? Humans take time, don't they? <laughs> so anyway, uh, that hope in God is in, important. Um, why are thou cast down, O my soul? And why are thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Hope will be health. Hope based in God will be health to you. Just know that. Uh, Jeremiah's cry. I thought this was interesting because 
he's having a discussion with his mind and uh, uh, in Lamentations 3, 14 through 29, uh, Jeremiah is saying, I was in a derision to all my people. In other words, he, he was causing problems for them. And their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. Uh, wormwood is a type of poison uh, that it's translated poison or deadly substance. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. But then he changes here. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. My hope has gone. My soul hath them still in remembrance. Now, his soul, remember, your soul is your mind, your will, and, remember, and your emotions. So he was calling, he's asking his mind, listen, what have I, what have I known? I'm, I'm going to recall this. He said, remember, and is humbled in me. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood or the poison and the gall. Then he says, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind. All right, he's battling this. If you're battling something in your mind, just in the name of the Lord say, I command my mind to recall what the Word says. Amen. Recall what the Word says. Even Jeremiah, a famous prophet, he had this battle going on in his head. He said, therefore I have hope. Or have I hope? It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both, what? Hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Yeah. Hope and quietly wait. <laughs> And this was being addressed to Jeremiah, a famous preacher, <laughs> a famous prophet of God. He was having this battle in his head, this in his mind. You know, when, you know you're being thrown in jail, you're being tortured, you're experiencing maybe ill health, all these things. He had to tell his soul, recall the Lord. Remember the Lord. Remember that your hope is in him. Amen. And as we see these last days growing more intense, I encourage you, remember, allow that baptism of the Holy Spirit to pour out of you. And today, if that's not happening, I just want to take a moment here. If that's not happening in your life, and before we go on with that, I want to, there was one other verse I wanted to read about hope. Um, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. We have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void. Hallelujah, of the offenses. In other words, don't allow the offenses to capture your mind. Don't allow the things you've done wrong to capture your mind. The Bible provides a way. It's called repent. When you repent, those things that have tortured you, bothered you, plagued you, they go. They go in Jesus' mind and in Jesus' name. But know that you can then build. What do you build when you get rid of that? You build on hope. Amen? How many are ready to build on his hope and his righteousness today? Amen? Let's stand. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, there are many words being thrown around this world. 
We hear them in the news. We hear them from our family members. We hear them from our work. We hear them everywhere. Words that often say, I wish this, or I wish they would do this, or I wish they would be this way, or I wish I could do this, or I wish I had more money. I wish, I wish. But Lord, today on this day of Pentecost, I would ask that a baptism of your Holy Spirit would fill each one that's here today. Each one that's here today. Each one. Hallelujah. I would ask that the hope that David saw in this day of Pentecost would rise up. Maybe you've struggled. Maybe you've been in church your whole life. Maybe you just said, listen, I've heard this so many times. I'm, I, I don't know what to believe. Well, lay all those things aside today, this day of Pentecost, and ask the Lord directly. Go right to him. Forget I'm even here. I want you to ask him. I want you to ask him. Say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my thoughts. Transform me today. Lord, I have not built my hope or my desires on what the Bible says is your hope. Forgive me for that. Now today, Lord, I make a pledge. I make a vow today that I will hope in the Lord. Because the Bible even says that by hope you are saved. See, if you will allow the hope of God to rise up, it'll be much easier for you today to say yes to him and to say yes to the Holy Spirit's baptism in your life. Hallelujah. 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 If that's, if that's you today, just slip up your hand. Just say, my hope has been a little off track, John. I want to just change my attitude of hope. Anyone? Anyone here want to change? I see that hand, those hands. I see many hands. Thank you. Father, know that that hope will transform us. And Father, I pray for those that have raised their hands today that right now, right now, transformation into the kingdom of God and his righteousness is taking place. Salvation is taking place. Baptism in your spirit is taking place. And a resurrection of your hope, hallelujah, is taking place. I'm going to leave wishing behind and I'm going to hope in you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 So today, Father, we thank you. We rejoice for this opportunity. The altars are open if you want to come forward and pray. I'll be here. Billy will be here. Others will be here to pray with you. Anybody that wants to come forward, please come forward and pray. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, you have declared that your word is true. You have declared that tongues is for today. You have declared that the hope of glory that can come forth from tongues, Lord, can manifest in our lives. So today, Lord, if someone has not been filled by your Holy Spirit, we pray that right now they're filled in Jesus' name. They're filled in Jesus' name. Allow his power and authority and his love and his hope to be established in you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Can we just lift our hands and, and say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. We thank you. We love you. And you're dismissed. Thank you. If you've never visited us at Five Rivers, we want to invite you to this week's services with ministry for the entire family. For location information, visit us online at fiveriverschurch.com.